We don't live together. What is to be done? You see, we are working in a very difficult environment. Everything is tough. It's not that there's everybody, it's not like 1994. I remember when I came into this first, when I was at the Hebrew University, 1994, you know, everybody was a gun ho You know, this will happen, that will happen. Most of it didn't happen. And that was a very upbeat time. This is a, a not so upbeat time. But we have to try to save the environment in spite of the politics. And I would like to ask you not to go too much into history. It's very easy to blame the other for what's happened. To say, oh, the Israelis didn't do this, the Palestinians didn't do this, you see it very much in the issue of water, where two sides are, sort of have their own narratives, each of which puts the blame firmly on the other. This is unhelpful. It's not going to help. It's okay. Some of it is true. I mean, no doubt there are instances of extreme stupidity on both sides. But that's not going to help. What we're going to look for, I hope, in, is something creative. And we would like you, once the speakers have finished speaking, to come with your ideas. What do you think? What can be done? Everybody knows the parameters. What can we do? Anyway, that's by way of introduction. The work of IPCRI in, in this, um, this area has been aimed at two objectives. The first is to protect the environment and the quality of life. This, whatever happens, in 50 years' time, Jews and Arabs are going to be living here. We don't want them, I don't want them, you don't want them to live in a desert. We don't want them to have to ration water, to have no open spaces, because they built solidly from, from down to Beersheba. We, we don't want that. Then we want, we hope that by working together on the environment, those involved in that work will get to know one another and form links between them. That is the, as it were, the peace aspect of this work. That if you work with people and you see them, then you have a different attitude to their being. You can't hate somebody you sit down with meetings 16 times and you argue about this and that. You can dislike them, but you can't hate them because you see that they have their human problems. I think that that type of aim is shared by most of the people who work in this environment, most of the organizations. They're not expressed necessarily in the same way, but the bigger or the organizations which do significant cross-border work, notably Friends of the Earth, which I think personally is the most successful and most active of the organizations doing this, then the Arab Institute, which is represented here and where there's been some excellent work, and the IMCRI, which though it's a small program, has been quite a creative program, I think, over the years, these type of organizations and NGOs in Palestine and Israel, and academics from different universities and professionals, they all have the same basic aims, to protect the environment and promote some kind of understanding. I would call it peace. It would be too, too elaborate to call it peace, but understand it, certainly. This isn't the place to review the cooperative projects taking place. We shall be looking at a difficult situation and see what can be done. For in spite of the cross-border efforts, in spite of the success of Friends of the Earth and other organizations, the situation is not getting better. My own personal opinion is getting slightly worse, and that is very unfortunate. You see, in 1994, when the Joint Water Committee was established, and the multilateral talks, incidentally, Mohammed Saeed was uh, the head of the Palestinian uh, side of the discussions in the multilaterals on the environment and brought out the Bahrain de uh, Declaration in 1994, which seemed at that time, 94? Yeah. Which seemed a great breakthrough at the time, but for different reasons didn't lead to so much. We are, we are now, we went up until about 1996 or 7, 8, now we're going down. We're going down slowly. Now, why is it, why is this, what's happened? What's happened is that the political optimism has faded. People are no longer confident. The number of people believing in a, a two-state solution has diminished. The general situation is not what it was, and that affects work on the environment. But more specifically, there are, I think, four or five real problems which prevent real cooperation. I'm making an assumption here, of course, that cooperation is a good thing. I guess you will all agree with it. I suppose there are people who won't agree with it, but we, we make that assumption. 
First of all, the general discouragement. Palestinian society particularly is handicapped by the fact that people have so many other questions, problems, you know. If you can't get your child to the hospital where you want him, if you can't cross a checkpoint for five hours, the environment takes a minor place in your thinking. It, you don't have time for it. Then there's donor fatigue. We are financed in Ukraine, as most of the environmental organizations are, in fact, by donors, many of whom come from uh, the international community. Well, they pay for this, for that, for wells. And many of them have been damaged during conflicts of various kinds. And this problem seems intractable. It seems, um, Dita, there's a place here, come um, the, the, um, the, uh, these seem intractable problems and the donors are fed up with Palestinians and Israelis in my opinion. They feel that, oh God, another application for work on water. We spent so many millions and we haven't got the kind of cooperation, the kind of results we would like. Then there are ordinary logistic problems. It's very easy to underrate to these. In my opinion, they're, all, they're tremendously significant. The fact that groups of young people, we had in it, for example, in 1998, a program where we took Palestinians who were managing parks and open spaces to the natural, the, uh, then what was called, I think, the Nature and Parks Authority, it's changed its name since, and they, they came, they spent a week here, a week in Carmel, a week, and they learned a lot. You can't do that today, or at least if you can, you've got to be very persistent and you've got to get permits and this and that. You can't improvise. Children, parents don't like their children to go into the West Bank and vice versa. Israeli parents are afraid of the West Bank. Palestinian parents are cautious about Israel. These logistic problems are very significant. Then, I think, the, the straight political considerations, which I've talked about already, those are the sort of obstacles we have to work within. We are not going to change the political climate. We have what we have, we have. When I was talking just now to Alan, I said it's like playing tennis with a thunderstorm. The thunderstorm is there, it might rain at any minute, but you've still got to play. You can't stop playing, because if you stop playing, you're going to finish up with a miserable situation for everybody. And that's what we're fighting against. If both parties are committed, and as we said, no progress was made. Going back through history, I would say that there, are, there were a number of mistakes that we have committed, both sides. Well, at least speaking from my side, none of the peace treaties or agreements was made open or available to the public. So the public were not part of any peace agreement as if it was imposed on them. This is what we have achieved for you. We are the negotiators, we have thought this is right, and this is what you can get. That was one of the mistakes. Second, the media was completely away from, the media was always talk about negotiations, but not the impact, not the prerequisites, not the values. So it was politicized, at least on the environmental issue, how much have we achieved? Have we defeated the Israeli negotiator or not? That was, the, that was not the way. Now, again, if we are going to wait until a peace treaty is there, then we say it is negotiation, it is cooperation. The polls of two days ago, it said that only 10 to 12 percent of both sides, Israelis and Palestinians, believe that there will be negotiation soon without further conflict and third person are saying that there might be some negotiations, but conflict will continue. Third person is not good enough. But again, about 60 percent, they believe that they, there will not be a two-step solution at least in the next five years. Should we wait for five more years until we see a cooperation? There are at least a hundred reasons why we should cooperate. At least the two examples of the trade, slurry, or wastewater are good enough to make us think carefully should we go for negotiation or not. Now, there were a lot of attempts at the governmental level, official level, as well as NGO level. 
in a discussion which was a joint discussion held in Morocco and Paris two years ago under the X group, a number of areas were proposed and were suggested. Climate change was discussed. We are still behind in that. Climate change was discussed, trade was discussed, wastewater was discussed. A whole list of ideas was there that these can be potential, at least research, and regardless of the fact that these are only a minority, the researchers, having concrete, continuous research will bring people together and build trust between the two parties. And that is what we should look for. Is there enough trust that we can build on? There is some trust for all of us who are here on the table. I believe that there is enough and full trust between us that we can do something together. But if we keep listening to the politicians, we can reach nowhere. It is a fact that time is running short, population is still increasing in both sides, and uh, as you said, ideas are uh, running short, simply because trust was not really uh, built enough at the first place. Now, there are different scenarios how to proceed. Should we go separate? I mean that Israel and Palestine go into their own developmental business without the other party. That's a scenario, which is mostly happening today. Should we coordinate? And coordination was not there for most of the time, and that's affected, very much affected by the political atmosphere. At least yesterday, there was the first economic meeting. And I was hoping that through the committee that they have established, at least an environmental related committee within the economic committee, at least to look into the environmental requirements of trade between the two both parties. But that was not uh, mentioned at all. Should we go jointly? And that would have a positive impact. Or should we bring a third party that can mediate and work between both of us? Yani, the, all of these are still valid, but I'm still hoping that we go jointly, what is coordinated to start with in a number of areas. Again, involving the public, involving the media would bring us at least a step forward. Now, has the international community interest been built? It's through that, through the negotiations, there were at least 35 different countries around the table between countries or donors, but as if they were supporting us morally, not financially. When it came to finance, they were still behind. But looking at the, what the Friends of the Earth are doing in the Jordan Valley profile, I was one of their meetings in Jericho. There was a feeling that donors would be very much interested in actual joint research which can lead to implementation on the ground. Those countries which have sort of expressed their interest to see the outcome of that profile of the Jordan area and to be part of the implementation of the recommendation was encouraging. So at least that I want to know where should we think of. Should we think of a research only or a research with doable outcomes or practical outcomes that can be limited? That issue of illegal dumping, I'm sure if we come up with ideas which can be implemented, would find some donors who are interested. What was missing is that all the good words, the goodwill that was said by negotiators, by researchers, by interest groups, was not really documented in a people-to-people -people guide book. That was missing. The terminology was not selected carefully. Again, even, uh, sorry for that, if we keep saying that those Palestinians who come in are brave as if we are doing something wrong and we have taken responsibility for being here, it is, should we build trust through individuals or through governments? I would say building trust through individuals, through researchers, that can be built on. 
but if we start or wait until governments build trust between two nations, we will get nowhere. I have told several times that there should be always a technical group who would meet together again and again and come up with ideas. It's true that Epic Tree or Friends of Earth are doing some of that, but in most of the cases, limited to the budget that they have. But a group of technical group of volunteers, just similar to the Environmental Experts Committee, which has died in the year 2000, which I was chairing the presidential side of that, if such a committee is brought back to life, a technical group of people who bring in ideas and even give these ideas free to NGOs who are working or interested or even to the government, they can get somewhere. I'm sure that between both sides, there are still people who believe that we can get somewhere. I will be working again and again for a peace that has been written and for cooperation, which I will always be part of that. A resource center which documents the success stories in both sides would help. A reference center that bring in ideas or the outcome of the work of the Vegan Committee, or at least bring in successful stories from other parts of the world, or to disseminate or to publicize success stories which are practiced here locally. The example of UNDP program in the West Water in the north part of the West Bank, where joint plants are built for Israeli and Palestinian communities. I'm not sure if anyone has heard of that. Regardless if that was a success or a failure, that was not publicized. Again, media was not there, the public were not there. Now they are, they are making sort of a, a, an assessment. Has that improved the people attitude towards the other party or not? I would like to see the result of that, saying that having joint wastewater facilities have at least added 5% to the trust building between both parties. So again, a digital committee and a joint resource center, resource center might help. But again, to bring in ideas for things like study, like trade, even to go practically to invest in building joint laboratories at the borders, again, that would help in sustainability, in development, and in the trust building between both parties. Thank you. Okay, Robin asked us not to dwell on the past, and I'll try to, to focus on some ideas that we might uh, do. But I think we have to remember why those sessions and then the euphoria and the hopes around, around the Oslo process uh, didn't produce the kind of environmental dividends that many of us had hoped about. Because some of those dynamics still exist and we have to uh, recognize them and maybe think about how we can overcome them if we're gonna move forward. So the first of all is the fundamental asymmetry which exists in this region I think has only gotten worse. So that the financial capabilities and the kind of environmental problems the two countries face are very different. And that's a real challenge both in terms of establishing a single shared uh, agenda because if you're not getting water uh, but two or three times a week, uh, concerns about you know, EDC chemicals inside of wastewater may not be the most important thing if you don't have water in the first place. So there's, there is this sort of gap between a developing economy and a post-industrial economy. Um, there's also, I think, a uh, pervasive lack of political interest on this issue on all sides. Um, I think it's uh, unimaginable that, that people haven't seen the potential of the environment to move forward and move the discussions forward. And um, the last uh, several months I've, I've been in touch with uh, at Sippy Whitney, and um, I think we could make her an environmentalist because we could convince her that it would help the environment. And I think that's, uh, without getting the politicians involved, at the end of the day, it's very hard to move things, and that's something we have to do. Uh, Robin mentioned the lack of trust, which I think uh, is against all of us, and I won't uh, go beyond that. But I'd also add that there is a, uh, a sense I get sometimes when I hear and I talk to friends in Jordan or in Palestine 
sort of a fear of domination. It's a concern that was the same sense, I think, when uh, about taking water, taking over the Chadera uh, desalination plant. And, and it was, we don't want to have a post-colonial dynamic of, of technological domination. That's a sensitivity which makes it even more complicated. So there are all, all of these problems. But I'm still optimistic, and I want to talk about some of the new things that make it more uh, promising, I think, and what we might, why we might actually be able to move forward. We'll talk about three or four new areas which didn't exist 15 years ago, which might be areas of cooperation environmentally. So, first of all, um, I want to say that first, one reason we might be able to cooperate better is because there's been, um, how should I put it, environmental conditions, for the most part, have not gotten better, they've gotten worse. Um, Climate change was mentioned here, I think it was on the agenda in a serious way. We now know that it's not just the gloomy predictions of Al Gore, it is a new uh, rainfall patterns and precipitation uh, situation in the area, certainly in the, in the Jordan River uh, basin. There's no question that we're getting less water than we used to have. We don't have the same kind of uh, water re resources we used to be able to uh, work on. Uh, 300 more wells have been closed due to contamination. Uh, issues of, of food security all of a sudden are important here. I don't think we thought about that. So those are issues which make issues like desertification and loss of land fertility germane where they never used to be. The second reason why I think that uh, we might be hopeful is actually because there are new technologies which make things easier. I'm happy to quote uh, Professor Shubal who is to talk about the, the good thing about desalination is it manages to trump the hydro hysteria which often characterized discussions, we can now think about water maybe more dispassionately because it is a, a product that we can uh, produce. Um, the internet gives us the ability to communicate in a way we never could, if it's through Skyping or Facebook. So there's ways of communicating that even uh, the permits and the, the Israeli armies won't be able to stymie when we try to uh, do that. And politically, I'm hopeful today because uh, just at a very narrow level, the Minister of Environment, uh, in Israel at least, is in this government, at least what he told me, only because he hopes it will promote, promote the peace process. And I think the previous Minister of Environment, who may have done some very good things, did everything he could to make sure the peace process didn't really move forward, at least environmentally. It was a, a four years of absolutely no intervention on that part. And so that's a real sea change, or a, a polar opposite in terms of the personalities and the commitment. And that's an opportunity which we should seize because there is somebody uh, on the Israeli side who does, does care. So those are my uh, reasons why things have changed, and I'll talk about a few projects which I think might be important. Uh, the good news is, is that uh, desalination may produce the kind of water abundance that will allow us to really actually do something there. Uh, the updated figures, I just got them yesterday in preparation for today, is that by the end of 2014, five Israeli desalination plants will produce 600 million cubic meters of water. That's an unbelievable change in the capacity, and it means that not only will there be water for rivers, but there also will be much more water, I believe, in the final negotiations with the Palestinians, and we can start thinking about uh, doing some, something important to bring back life to dry streams and rivers. So I think that is a source of, of uh, optimism. And at the same time, I think we need to be much more circumspect about wastewater reuse, which was considered such a great achievement, but uh, the more I talk to people, particularly agricultural experts, there's some concern that this experiment, which we've been doing in Israel for 30 years, may not actually be as a happy one as we expect. <coughs> if the sodium compounds in the residual sarts catalyze an ion exchange which permanently alter the soil, and we're seeing uh, some of the fruit and the trees that, are, that have been um, irrigated for so long with wastewater going downhill, so I'm thinking that maybe desal might be a more uh, important technology to invest in the wastewater reuse. <coughs> but that brings us to the issue of uh, greenhouse gases, because uh, the Ashkelon plant alone increases Israeli energy consumption by 1%. And uh, Israel went on the record, and Copenhagen is committing to commit, it, to commit itself to dropping our greenhouse gas emissions, and we need to do more. I think we're very, very uh, lucky to have with us Dr. Riyad Hadali, who's with us, who is the the director of the uh, Palestinian Solar and Sustainable Energy. These are technologies which I think should be taken off. There's things we can do together. I think within Israel, it, the Bedouin community could be a, uh, a remarkable, um, I should put it, it could be a remarkable force to help them and empower them economically. But I think uh, solar energy and sustainable energy projects could be a new 
horizon, a new area of cooperation, which we haven't had until now. The other area I want to talk about is natural gas. Now, there's a big debate in Israel over the uh, levels of export, but on the whole, we all know that natural gas is good news, and that it means that the greenhouse gas emissions will be much smaller, and energy independence will be reached sooner. And we may move within seven years, like other countries, to 50% of the fleet could move to natural gas. But the trouble is that almost all of the potential fields are out in the territorial, or the, in the outside of Israel's territorial laws and their economic zone, and there's not really a serious um, oversight. So that's a law we have to make, but I think it would be a very exciting thing, assuming that across from the Gaza Strip there will be some natural gas exploration, if we could talk about how do we put a regulatory system in place and inspection to make sure that we don't have the kind of horrible spills and accidents in those uh, facilities that other parts in the area have seen. We all know how important the coasts are to everybody, and that's the <coughs> cooperation. There's no reason why we couldn't do that together, I believe. And the last thing I want to talk is a bit about peace parks. The point is, is that I think there is a, a potential. I think the Israelis and the Palestinians are more enthusiastic than the Jordanians, at least. And I think that, um, that there is tremendous things that can be done immediately. Um, I'm a big believer in afforestation. I think that if you look at the numbers, in 1948, there was about 1.7% of the lands in Israel were covered with forest. Today, it's up to 8%. And still, in Jordan and Palestine, it's only about 1.5%, 1%. And respectively, I think we could be doing more in terms of making joint areas or mapping out areas or presenting ideas for peace parks and think about how we can maximize the ecosystem services from, from these kind of initiatives. I'm going to just wrap up by saying that I, I don't believe that uh, Secretary of State Kerry is going to leave this region empty-handed. I don't think he put that much energy in last week to, well, this week actually, yeah. this week, into, I think he is going to force the sides to come to the table. And our job is not to make the mistake of the 1990s and try to create real projects that can be uh, both built into the negotiations, funded, and can be a, a source of confidence-building measures and not be caught with uh, vague notions that come with real joint initiatives. And I think uh, we have enough years of experience and enough creativity and trust, we may not trust between leaders, but certainly in the environmental community, we know each other and we can put things on the table that will make a difference. So I'll leave my comments at that and maybe we'll get to hear it. Well, thank you. Very much.